Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation. And the Dnieper Natural History Programming Fund for KNME-TV. And viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, the president's COVID supply chain chief is a former New Mexican who's trying to address the pandemic equitably. And that means not just pushing everything into major urban areas, making sure that we get everywhere. Plus the return of our land as we look at the impact of groundwater pollution near New Mexico military bases. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. This month's Our Land episode takes you to a dairy outside of Clovis that's been impacted by pollutants from Cannon Air Force Base. It's part of our Groundwater War Project. We'll take a look at the state's newfound confidence in getting kids into the classroom full time by early April and ask the line opinion panel about the political implications for everyone involved, as well as the day to day impacts on parents, students and teachers. Our crew also weighs in on the two man team that will lead Albuquerque's beleaguered police force in a new effort to provide a framework for a statewide broadband build out. Here's the line. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham and Education Secretary Ryan Stewart are sticking to the back to school pledge the governor made in her State of the State address last month. Joining us to talk about back to school again in the week's other headlines is our line opinion panel. Line regular and UNM law professor Serge Martinez is back. Good to see you, sir. Another regular and former House Minority Whip Daniel Foley returns for another go. And we're very happy to have as our guest this week, former Lieutenant Governor Diane Dennish. Thanks for joining us as well to offer your thoughts. Now, Republicans have been calling for a full return to in-person learning for a while. We'll only have five or six weeks of school in the current school year. Is that better than nothing, Daniel? Or is this just, I don't know, too late to make a big difference in your view? Well, it depends on who you're talking to, right? Okay. I mean, it's clearly going to be too late for high school seniors. Mm. I mean, just, you know, and, and that's good point. It's not any fault, right? It's just the pandemic, the way things are. Mm -hmm. I mean, tell them, you know, tell some high school senior, hey, congratulations. You're going to get a month of high school to do all the homecoming and prom and all those magical moments that every one of us remember about our high school senior year. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's too late. You know, if you're in fifth grade, it's not too late. So, um, but again, that's, I don't think that's a, that's an indictment on any individual. That's just the system, the way it is. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get it. It's, it's been a, it's been a tough year, a little over a year. And, uh, it had, you know, these, these kids have not gotten a fair shake, um, from, from this. And so, you know, I think getting them back at any point is going to be, uh, you know, getting them any sense of normalcy is going to help. I mean, we, we cannot ignore, you know, the suicide rate and the other issues that are present amongst these young people mm -hmm. during this time. So I think any any resemblance of normalcy, um, and I think schools are working really hard diligently. I think the governor is, I think the legislature is, I think school boards are to try to get as much of this real, you know, reality back for these kids as they possibly can while still keeping people safe. You know, the one, the one negative thing I will say mm -hmm. is, is that, to me, the frustration that I, I watch from the outside, if I was a parent with a kid, in, you know, in high school or lower, it just, there just seems to be an inconsistency, right? It's, you know, we got to wear a mask. We don't got to wear a mask. We got to be six feet apart, got to be 12 feet apart, got to get a shot, can't get a shot. Once you get it, once you have it, you're good for three months. You're not contagious. And, you know, so, I mean, there's just this whole process that I think is everybody's trying to figure out as we go through this, that um, I do think that some of the folks you know, that we've turned to, to say, follow the science. I think, I think on some, some levels, they've dropped the ball for us um, in hindsight, but hindsight's always 2020. It's a difficulty. This thing was so fast moving, no doubt. Lieutenant Governor, interesting. Uh, when I think about this, how much of, of where the governor's going on this is being driven by what the Biden administration has really sort of laid out there when you think about it? Um, you know, they have their goals. Is the governor just lining up with the federal goals here? I think that um, she's trying to comply with the, with the Biden administration's directives of getting kids back in school. Mm -hmm. I agree with Dan. I think something is better than nothing, especially for older teenage kids mm -hmm. uh, who who really need that social context. Having a granddaughter who's going to graduate in May, I think going back to school for her in Oklahoma in February was a big deal. But I will say this: one thing our governor has done right about this is they haven't gone back and forth. 
uh, many states opened, had to close, opened, had to close while the pandemic. Um, and now that the numbers are really on the downturn, uh, there's vaccinations coming in great numbers. Uh, New Mexico leads the vaccination rate across the country. Um, uh, all of those things are coming together at a good time to reopen our schools. But I do think there is a willingness to comply and follow the national directive. Yeah. Uh, Serge, you know, the Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor mentioned the word vaccination. We got to go there. Um, you know, this is a big part of this return, so to speak, for teachers. Boy, you know, Shelby Perea and Colleen Hild in the journal a little bit ago noted that New Mexico isn't getting extra doses in you know, can we possibly get all teachers vaccinated by April 5th? Is this possible? Uh, you know, I don't know the actual numbers. It seems like a big task and one that, uh, you know, should have been prioritized a while back. Mm -hmm. I've been frustrated by the, the messaging as well as sort of the policy, some incoherency or inconsistency, I should say, saying, you know, we want to get folks back in school, but we're not going to prioritize the teachers mm -hmm. with vaccines is sending not only sending mixed messages it's making it harder to accomplish you know this really important goal of getting students teachers families everyone comfortable with being back in school um i you know again i don't know the actual numbers i know that the vaccine rollout has been proceeding apace and hopefully that will that will make give everyone the comfort they need to get open by april 5th but I'm, I'm impressed with what New Mexico has done thus far. But should, think, should we have slid up the vaccination for teachers in the calendar a little bit earlier? Maybe even two weeks would have made a big difference if you, when you think about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if, if the goal has been and the eye has, we had our eyes on getting folks back into school and getting this open, right? Which is an unalloyed good thing, I think. We really should have been prioritizing that in the vaccine rollout and had a consistent message and policy about that. Right. It's just a reminder, of course, as I mentioned the setup, the governor mentioned this in her state of the state. So that was in January. It wasn't as if, you know, <laughs> it was just the day before yesterday. But, uh, Daniel, I'm interested in your, in your thought on this, too. You know, some, a lot of this depends on where families decide to kind of fall on this, meaning, you know, there remains the fully remote option. And for a lot of families, they're just not trusting what's going to happen out there. So if a large number of families decide to stay remote, what does that do to the equation? Yeah, I, th I think it's I think it's an interesting scenario. You know, we uh, you know, in my my real life, we work with a lot of public schools and some private schools. And it's it's been both challenging and, and an opportunity. Right. I mean, I had a conversation with one of my private schools that we represent in Albuquerque, who was saying, you know, their student population has boomed and it's boomed because they've been able to really master this this remote learning and a lot of these kids don't want to come to school they don't want to travel and they're they're thinking that this is a model that they can now replicate around new mexico without having to build a building if you want to get a, an education from one of these schools you know if you want to go to sandia prep or albuquerque academy and you live in roswell you know this remote learning has really enhanced the opportunity to be able to wow. do that i hadn't thought about uh, that so so it's also been able to man they've also been able to manage knowing which kids are coming on what day and how they're going to do it I, I would venture to say that we're forever going to be in a hybrid model, mm. I think, especially with older kids going forward, which isn't really odd. Right. I mean, I remember talking to my parents and, you know, my parents from the time they were, you know, obviously they're both passed away and they're both be well in their 80s today. But, you know, my bad mom used to talk about, you know, from their sophomore year in high school, you know, they went to school until noon and then they were done at noon and they had a job because you had to get a job and you had to get the family. And, you know, not only that, you know, at the time my mom went to school, there were, you know, 11,000 kids in her class, literally, because it was the only school in Brooklyn. And so you had four different, you know, kids went from six to 10 and mm -hmm. you know, 11 to three and three to seven. And, you know, they, they oh, did yeah. all of that. And, you know, I don't think our country was that bad. You know, I, I think it's really highlighting uh, the, the conversation that we've been, I think we've been failing on in this country, which is not everybody's going to college and vocational education and getting people out in the work. I, I so I think there are some opportunities for successes to rise out of this, uh, to, to be helpful. But I do think that there's going to be a number of people, there's always been a number of people that want to homeschool. Right. And I think they've been able to seize on this opportunity and get resources, which I don't think is a bad thing. But I think there's a lot of people I know a lot of people I've talked to who have said, you know, I, I don't I don't know if my kid 
is fit to go back five days a week, seven hours a day and do all of that stuff. So it's going to be interesting to see how we maximize this moving forward. And I'll throw back into your, your previous lap of the balance about how we keep kids mentally stable, you know, with social interaction, all that kind of thing, too. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, I mentioned the state of the state address, of course, but Another angle of that from the governor was uh, on vaccinations is that teachers, the union specifically, were on board at that time and that things were plowing forward. In fact, Santa Fe has an agreement in place that teachers don't have to go back until they're vaccinated. I, I find this sort of interesting and I'm interested in where you're at on this with unions. Where should teachers be on this right now? Well, I think that's an interesting concept. You know, I think the governor of California said at one point, he said that, um, you know, if you're waiting till 100% of teachers are vaccinated, then we're never going to open up because right. there's mm -hmm. going to be a certain segment of teachers mm -hmm. who are not going to be able to be vaccinated. And there's going to be a certain segment of teachers who do not choose not to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think the union can satisfy all those interests. Uh, I think going back on April 5th is going to be a test for teachers and a difficult one of whether they can do a combined hybrid in-person learning. If you've read some of the uh, things that are happening with that, it's a very difficult model if they're trying to combine that in one classroom or one subject matter. Uh, it makes it much harder and paying attention to kids that are there in person and the kids that are on their Zoom mm -hmm. link. I think it's going to be tough, but I think that you know, I, frankly, I think the unions have to be negotiating on this and get ready for it. Right. I would say about the earlier model of educating really much earlier, uh, vaccinating educators earlier, mm -hmm. that no one else was vaccinated. So even if they were getting their vaccinations way back at the beginning, parents weren't being vaccinated, grandparents weren't being vaccinated, the virus was still out there. And as you learn when you get vaccinated, like I've been, that doesn't mean you can't get it. It just means you may not die from it and you're not going to maybe not have to be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean you're not going to get the virus. That's a good and point. Gene, there. At a national level, Gene, I think the interesting thing is we're, I'm hearing talk of folks driving to Amarillo to get the shot. Oh, sure. Yep. Drive from up New Mexico. No, That's right. There's no list, right? There's no, That's hey, right. We, it's we, everyone 65 or older in Texas. Yeah, That's right. in Texas. They've yeah, got an abundance of shots. I have experience with that. Someone who went and they asked why, and the Amarillo people said, we were forced to open it up because we don't have enough people in Texas who are willing to get the vaccine. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so they were going to waste their doses. Yeah. So they've invited people from all the surrounding states, and their parking lots apparently are full of New Mexico license plates. Wow. But Interesting you, don't point there. you don't have an age limit or any That's underlying right. respect. That's right. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, the school's saga continues, but we're out of time for now with this group. Um, back in a few minutes, though, to talk about broadband service and whether a new cohesive plan is ahead on that issue for New Mexico. I need you to come here and check my water and check my milk. Because I didn't want to have it, uh, that milk supply contaminate what goes to the public. I wanted to know where it was at. So they came out, did a test, and they said, uh, well, if this comes positive, you know that we're going to have to, you're going to have to start dumping your milk and we're gonna, you're going to lose your grade A permit. And I said, I understand, but I, I just need to know. Tim Manning is President Biden's National COVID Supply Chain Coordinator. That means he's part of the vaccine rollout and is in charge of getting vital PPE supplies to all parts of the country. That can be especially tricky in a place like New Mexico, something Mr. Manning knows well since he led the State Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management under then Governor Bill Richardson. Producer Matt Grubbs spoke to Mr. Manning recently about the challenges ahead for the White House and how his time in New Mexico informed his work. Well, Tim Manning, thanks so much for taking a little bit of time out of your day to um, chat with us about what you're doing. And that's really my first question is, um, when the administration contacted you, um, what were they asking you to do? Well, Matt, the, uh, you know, when I started talking to folks, uh, the Biden administration, uh, through the, you know, through the fall and, and um, coming up in the transition, you know, it was clear, I think the president was clear all through the campaign that, uh, he saw a need for a, a kind of closer 
coordination and integration of the COVID response. Uh, you know, pull the, pulling the government together and, and having the federal government assume its responsibility in supporting the states and supporting communities all across the country uh, in providing the assistance necessary. Uh, and in particular, the role that he asked me to fill as the supply coordinator that really comes out of the, the constraints of the uh, early parts of the pandemic when uh, you know, states were having to bid against each other for critical supplies and testing and PPE. Uh, and then as we go came through uh, the development of vaccines and the ramp up of uh, ma the manufacturing of, of vaccines and the distribution, uh, you know, the president called for, uh, saw a need and called for somebody to coordinate those efforts uh, kind of all across the government uh, and get work with states uh, among the states and communities to ensure that everybody who, has, who uh, needs material, whatever it might be, PPE, therapeutics, testing, diagnostics, vaccines, support for vaccines, has what they need uh, when they need it, and that we build the capacity uh, in America, onshoring, building additional manufacturing capacity here uh, so that we never find ourselves in this, can, uh, this position again. Uh, a lot of now, but it sounds like maybe a little bit of looking forward as well. Definitely. Um, so you're part of a, a part of a team there. Who else is on that team and, and how do you guys coordinate with each other? So the White House COVID response team, uh, there's, a, there's a, quite a few of us uh, working uh, out of the White House right now, uh, although uh, obviously not working in the White House. Uh, most of us are still distributed or working safely from home and keeping the, uh, uh, the state of the workplace safe. Uh, Jeff Zients is the COVID coordinator assistant to the president, working directly for the president. We have a, a great team of the other uh, key coordinator positions along with uh, as the supply coordinator. Uh, my colleagues, Carol Johnson is the testing coordinator, Bashar Shuker as the vaccine coordinator, vaccine policy coordinator. And Dr. Marcelo Nunez-Smith Nunez is the uh, equity coordinator. Because uh, you know, an important thing, everything we do is grounded in equity and making sure that we uh, count for and, and take care of all Americans. Uh, and it's a it's a you know num great number of people. Uh, some of the most brilliant public health uh, and kind of crisis response people I've ever come in contact with. It's a real honor and pleasure to work with them all every day. Yeah, you can see the attractiveness of of that job for you. When you walked in um, on on day one, what was the situation like, and sort of what's your assessment of how you've been able to improve on that? Well, you know the. As it's uh, often said, you know, uh, credit where credit's due, there was a, a great deal of work on the part of, you know, public health and the response community all across the country. People have been working just countless hours, uh, you know, very little sleep to try to, to protect Americans. But when we got when we got here, you know, there was a, a good deal of effort in the research and development and the vaccines, but there was no comprehensive plan for turning those vaccines into vaccinations. Uh, you know, there was... Uh, Pockets of, of strong work across the government, but no real strong centralized coordination of the, the federal government, uh, much less you know, a plan to support state and local government and communities and, and people all across the country. So the, ver the first thing we did was uh, write a, a strategy, actually write a plan. And the president uh, un un unveiled that on, on the Thursday after inauguration, uh, the, the first day after inauguration. Uh, and that's a, you know, a comprehensive strategy dealing with providing, you know, kind of the fundamental support in, in all of those key areas of testing and diagnosis to make sure we understand where the disease is, what's the progress, how is it affecting people? And, and now importantly, where are these, where variants are popping up, mutations in the virus so that we can keep track of, you know, where there's increasing severity or, or, or quickening, quickening spread. Um, and, uh, getting PPE developed, getting new PPE manufactured where there isn't enough to begin with and getting it out to you know, frontline workers. And then probably most critically right now is uh, the vaccination effort. Uh, everything you're seeing now, the community vaccination centers bringing FEMA to the table to build these large federally run and federally supported vaccination efforts all across the country. Uh, you know, none of that was there when we got here. This was all work that we've uh, done to coordinate in, in support of, of with, the, with the support of the Department of Defense and FEMA and Department of Homeland Security and Department of Health and Human Services, the VA, everybody coming to the table uh, to help protect communities. 
It's it's been a dozen years or so since you've worked in the state of New Mexico, um, but you don't forget the wide open spaces and the unique things about it for sure. Um, what does a state like New Mexico present to you in terms of supply chain challenges and how is that echoed um, maybe across the West? You know, the, the supply chain challenges and the response like this are, are extraordinarily complicated kind of everywhere and everywhere poses its own challenges. You know, New Mexico is, is unique in being the fifth largest state, but 35th in population. Uh, you know, there's a lot of really great, strong, close-knit, but very rural communities uh, with large distances between them. Uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of you know, the work we've been doing is trying to make sure that we provide that support equitably. And that means not just pushing everything into major urban areas, making sure that we get everywhere and that we can get a uh, vaccine, for example, into the places that people go for their care and go for vaccinations, which is why we're, while we're focused on, uh, while we're focusing on doing a lot of support through the large community vaccination centers, we're also focused on pushing support through uh, federally qualified health centers all across the country and a federal partnership with pharmacies so that we can bring vaccine out into uh, more distant rural communities. You know, one of the challenges with the supply chain, the lines of communication in the vaccine operation is that, uh, you know, one of the major vaccines right now, the Pfizer vaccine, you know, great vaccine, very effective, but very challenging logistics uh, requires storage at minus 80 degrees. So the the, the cold chain, we call it, uh, uh, it can be difficult getting it to far more remote uh, rural communities. But we're working, you know, through that with the support of the Defense Logistics Agency and lots of really, really great logisticians out of the Department of Defense and our corporate partners through the operation to bring that support everywhere. Uh, you know, it's uh, we're, we're doing great work uh, with the Navajo Nation. You know, there's, uh, as you mentioned, Matt, the you know, New Mexico is close to my heart and I'm very uh, familiar with the with the challenges of, of working, uh, you know, and uh, just the, the line, just the timelines it takes to get one place to the other. So we're taking great pains to make sure that we provide that support, uh, you know, into you know, America's heartland. Sure. Um, speaking of the Navajo Nation, Dr. Fauci spoke with us um, recently and talked a bit about uh, the strides that um, the Native communities have made in delivering the vaccine um, in New Mexico at rates that exceed the rest of the population. Have you seen the same kind of success um, in your part of this puzzle, um, or is there still work to be done there? Well, I would say we're seeing incredible progress kind of all across the board. Now, there is always going to be places, uh, you know, areas where we have to do more work, and we're watching very, very closely. We have a great team of data scientists that are looking at every day we see how, how many vaccinations happen, where did they happen, and where do we need to put more resources, where, do, where could, you know, what communities could use more support. Uh, I'm very happy to say, you know, uh, New Mexico is a, a shining example of a lot of really great practices uh, that we can take and, and use in other places. Uh, but we are definitely seeing progress. You know, the, um, we're just at, in the age group of 70 and over, we're right about 60% of the population has been vaccinated now, just coming on 50% for people 60 and older. Uh, you know, there has been uh, really great progress. I mean, that said, we had a tragic milestone just last week at you know, right at a half a million people uh, having passed away from, from this disease. So, uh, you know, the old phrase, you know, we've made a lot of progress, but we have a lot of work left to do and we'll, we'll keep at it until we get to everybody uh, who needs, who needs support. Sure. Um, one of the things in politics that you know is that you never know who you'll meet up, um, down the road. Uh, our governor, of course, um, was a colleague of yours in the cabinet for um, then Governor Richardson. Have you two had the chance to speak at all about New Mexico's situation? You know, uh, we have not had a chance to catch up personally yet, but I've worked very closely with uh, with uh, Matt Garcia, our chief of staff, and, and members in her cabinet, and Bianca Ortiz Wertheim, who's uh, in my old position. So yeah, we've I've had a lot of opportunity to work closely with uh, with her team all across, uh, you know, New Mexico, and and hopefully one of these days it just so happens that we just keep missing uh, in the meetings. I, I haven't had a chance to catch up with her yet, but hopefully, one of these days we will.
That question, um, you spoke a little bit earlier about uh, preparing for the next time, because as you know, there's always going to be a next time, um, particularly with, with things like viruses. Um, as you look at that situation, is it too soon to start planning, um, to start figuring out if there's a way to produce PPE in, in the US where companies can make a profit or, or the government should do that? It's never too early uh, to start planning for that, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we're absolutely working on that. That is a, a huge priority for us. So, you know, we're, we are focused on responding to the pandemic today. And that means getting what is, you know, critical material into the hands of responders right now. And we are focused on that in a way that is sustainable. You know, the president has been clear um, all along that it's important that we, you know, we build domestic manufacturing capacity in these key critical areas, that we treat public health preparedness, pandemic preparedness, like we do national security preparedness. And we build an industrial base for pandemic uh, response the way we build an industrial base around national security. Uh, you know, we've, we've lost more Americans than you know, many wars combined through this pandemic. And there is you know, no more stark reminder that we need to put all of our national efforts around building and sustaining this capacity. So we are absolutely, you know, when you hear a lot of references to the use of the Defense Production Act, what that often means, more often than not, means building new industrial capacity and building it in a way that's sustainable over the long term. So we never find ourselves in the situation that we did last spring, that we have the, the key commodities, we have the key equipment material, everything from PPE to vaccine manufacturing capacity uh, right here uh, in America and ready to respond to whatever may come. Tim Manning, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. In her State of the State address, Governor Lujan Grisham challenged lawmakers to spend fully half of their capital outlay money on broadband expansion. She called it, quote, the most urgently needed infrastructure investment we can make as a state, end quote. The Senate and House have each passed bills to create a state office for broadband access and expansion, noting that there's no statewide plan for broadband expansion and saying that means New Mexico is doing something it really does, leave federal matching dollars on the table. Lieutenant Governor, why is broad, and you've been around this issue for a long time, Lieutenant Governor, why has this been such a tough nut to crack? What's been the issue? Has it just been money or has it been something else besides money? Well, I think it's a, a combination of uh, the cost of investing in infrastructure. It's not sometimes as sexy as some of the policy issues. Mm -hmm. But I will say it's been about nine to 10 years coming to uh, what they've just passed in the legislature, which is to finally put it in the Office of Information Technology, have a complete division that can take all the six functions, efficiency, governance, uh, and getting fed, the, the real successes will be more access to federal dollars and rural New Mexico finding out where we don't meet FCC standards. And if we're ever going to, what we learned in the pandemic um, is that people can work anywhere, but they can't work anywhere if they don't have connectivity. And so I know from my experience in Hillsborough, New Mexico, people trying to come there and buy houses that teach classes in other parts of the country. They just can't do it because they don't have enough connectivity to make sure that they can do the things they want to do, but they want to work remotely in a smaller community. So I think, you know, Senator Michael Padilla has been do, really working this issue for uh, the last six or eight years. And finally, I think this is a real successful bill of creating opportunity. I don't know the answer to whether the governor was successful in getting them all to, con you know, uh, contribute money to the broadband effort. It's a big ask. There, yeah, <laughs> lots of federal dollars mm -hmm. coming in, and we can match some of those. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a real step forward in economic development, frankly. Uh, Serge, um, Senator Padilla is a co-sponsor of the bill. Interesting, he has a quote in the paper. Broad. Let's see here. Um, this, he says the state doesn't have a blueprint for broadband as it stands now. I would personally take issue for that. I think there's been a lot of blueprints out there for about 15 years, but we're here now. Um, and we're not sure how much money, as the Lieutenant Governor just mentioned, is going to come out of this session. But we do know it's going to be tens of millions and maybe even nine figures, honestly. How should we start? 
Uh, well, <clears throat> that, is, that is a great question, Gene. Uh, um, I mean, I think- It's a tough one, you know, how should it's- Yeah. The who start wins, is, who wins early, who, you know what I mean? It's, it's difficult. Right, I mean, I think the start is to say, to focus on say, look, we are starting now to recognize that broadband is not just a luxury or some, you know, it's and decommodifying and treating it as like a utility, something that's essential to not just, uh, as Lieutenant Governor said, you know, work, but health, education, access, political participation, all of these things. And so I think the way we, you know, the place to start is to obviously focus on the places that have no connectivity that have no access to this that are really missing out mm -hmm. and look at some of the things you know just last week the Jemez Pueblo uh, turned on its uh, some extra, more broadband access mm -hmm. on a network that it owns that's you know tribally owned uh, with others right looking at those models and understanding that <clears throat> excuse me that broadband is not going to be the you know incentivizing the market is has not worked it's not the, the market has failed a lot of folks in new mexico right. and looking at how we can really really approach that not again as a commodity or you know look at some sort of market solution but to say how do we immediately roll this out to the places that need it is is so important and to the standards that not just what you know the FCC says but what we think is actually going to be the standard that allows you to go to school now and in a few years and and what and you know and meet and look down the road a teeny bit as we've been trying to do as a state and I I applaud that but I you know this is the third or fourth time we've had a conversation in the last year about how crucial this is and I'm excited that things are happening and we're starting to recognize the value of this as a state Daniel, um, Cliff Pertle had a little bit of heartburn about the idea of opening yet another governmental office to handle something that, uh, you know, in a lot of states is handled by the private side, honestly, through investment and all that kind of a thing. Do you share that concern that we don't need another office and personnel and salary and all the things that go with it? To I, I, I mean, you, you, love to, you love to get me to be the anti-government guy, Gene. I'm with you. I, I, I got it. I mean, I'm... You know, I'm, I'm not sure that there's not a function of government that can handle this today if they want to handle it. But I think we're missing the, the real discussion, right? I, I don't think that there's a lack of desire to want to have broadband in New Mexico. I think, one, there's a lack of finances. Two, it is an unbelievable cost. I mean, since I was in the legislature, you know, it was all about running cable. Then it all became about running fiber optics. Then it came, became about getting the G, you know, G, G1, G2, G3. Now we're up to G5, right. uh, 5G service. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, now you've got. So, I, I mean, at some point, I'm with Eugene. We've had a, uh, we've had a, a blueprint for what we can do. The problem is, it's an, un, you know, unlike other states, Rhode Island, New York, even California, uh, Texas, to some extent. You know, when you when you live in a place like like the lieutenant governor's talking about Hillsborough, you know, drilling two miles of cable to get it laid in that community is not cheap. Mm -hmm. It is extremely expensive. It's a half million and, a mile. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you start talking about how do we wire New Mexico? Then on the flip side, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in my motorhome, and there's a lot of conversations about getting internet in motorhomes. And you know, you got Elon Musk right now who's working with a satellite that's working to give satellite uh, broadband access. It's about $135 a month right now. It's not It's not out completely. It's about $400 to get the equipment, and then $135 a month. And as long as you got a straight shot to the sky, mm -hmm. you're supposed to be able to get 5G quality internet service anywhere. So, so I, I think the problem is, the problem that's been around in New Mexico in this issue has been, you know, every time we've decided to jump on board for something, we're on the tail end of it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. want to go run a bunch of cable and then it's wireless. So I, if we're going to do this, I'd like to see us, you know, we've talked about Spaceport, we've talked about Rail Runner, we've talked... We should be at the front end of the technology because I can tell you, if you get something on the front end that kind of works in rural New Mexico, it's better than nothing. And the last thing you want is to tell these folks, hey, we got to run, you know, we're going to dig up all the mountains, dig up all the roads, run all these cables. And, you know, five years after we do all this, you're not going to have an option anyway, because the cables don't handle uh, the actual service. That's, that's being a concern. Delivered. That's a legit concern. Techn technology think, moves on. I do think there's a private sector solution to it. That's right. I think it's going to be satellite. Well, you, you wouldn't be alone on that. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, the, our Department of Information Technology put a price for an entire 
broadband rollout statewide, a price tag of two to five billion dollars. And that was a, a lot of sticker shock. LFC uh, reacted pretty strongly. Do we just have to get to a point, Lieutenant Governor, where we understand that that is the price of modern, <laughs> you know, technology? If we want to play globally, we're going to have to pony up big to make this happen. It, who, who has to sell this idea? I mean, how do we do this? Two to five billion dollars. Well, I think that um, it's a matter of change of thinking. Uh, col the culture about infrastructure is roads and Hi, you know, highways yep. and uh, trains and buses and mm -hmm. maybe even buildings. But broadband is becoming a part of the basic infrastructure of life. And um, so we do need to change that thinking. But if there's ever a time to do it and to do what this bill's doing to bring together, it's been very spread out. And mm -hmm. so there are many agencies involved and this will be a chance for those to come together under one umbrella, so to speak. But if there's ever a time to do it, it's now when we're getting these federal monies that we can actually take advantage of and make some of those first investments. Um, and, you know, economic development in very small rural communities really is somewhat dependent on that. Uh, if they're going to thrive or if they're going to just uh, be an older community where things, um, you know, where the population dies out and they go away and they close the post office and they're done. So I think that um, for economic development on a broader scale outside of the most populated areas, it's a real critical element. And I, th I hope that administrations in the future continue because it's not going to be just under this administration or even maybe the next one. I, I couldn't agree more. I want to support Lieutenant Governor's thought on that. If, in case you haven't seen it going on around the country, there is a huge push right now to get broadband in communities like the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, like uh, smaller New Mexico communities, because folks want to work remotely. There are folks all over this country looking for some place to go that's smaller, but they want to be able to work, so we have to get after this. That'll have to do it for broadband, though, without question, it'll come up again here. Up next, Laura Paskus and our land. In 2018, Art Scott learned that the water in his home and his dairy next to Cannon Air Force Base was polluted. Toxic chemicals used in firefighting foams at the base had seeped into the groundwater, and the water he and his family drank, the water his milk cows drank. The toxic chemicals are PFAS, or per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. This month on our land, Scott tells his story about finding out the water was contaminated, what has happened to his business, and what he hopes happens before the toxic pollution spreads further. My grandfather gave me an opportunity to buy a herd of cows, and I milked those animals, and I was eventually growing, and uh, then I had the opportunity to buy this land here in Clovis in uh, 1992. We've been here uh, 33 years, going on 34 this summer. It's been a great place. Uh, I thought the location was perfect. We had good groundwater here and was able to good soils to grow feed for the animals. And so it's been a it's been a good a good run. And then what's nice too being next to the Air Force base is you get to watch the air shows and you got a show every day. I mean these them them guys with the planes that they have, the F-16s, the F-111s, the Ospreys. We've seen uh, presidents and vice presidents land here. They would practice putting out fires. They, put, they have a plane that they put on fire or they have mock wrecks and then they would put it out. And uh, so, I mean, they would do that quite a bit. And then, then that's when the whole, all the, the story kind of begins with the PFOS. We had no idea what PFOS and PF, PFOA was. We had no idea. To this day, I couldn't tell you how to pronounce it. I'd, I would just scramble it all up. We had no idea that it was in our water until they came and they approached us and said, hey, we need to check your water. We're like, and I think they came twice. And the first time we told them, no, we, we don't want you on the property. And then the second time we said, "Ah, go right ahead. And uh, and so when they when we we got tested positive for PFOS, we were like kind of shocked. And so we have an employee's home that we have down the road here. They checked there and they checked our house. And then when they found out that it was positive, 
I asked him, I said, well, don't you think you should check the dairy? Because we have employees on the dairy, too. And they said, yes, that's true. We have, we, we'll check that water, too. And that's why they checked the, the, the dairy's water. And then when it was positive and the houses were positive, then that's when they started giving us bottled water. And they gave us bottled water, I guess, for about six months. And then I went out and I went ahead and put my own filters in. We found out what we were drinking was poisonous to our bodies and that it, it could affect your uh, kidneys. It, it affects your blood. It, it gets in your blood. And so we were concerned. And so me and my wife, we went ahead and got our blood tested and then we were positive. Of course, mine was higher than hers because I'm an old farm boy. I just drank well water. When I found out it was in my water, I called New Mexico Department of Agriculture and I asked them, I said, uh, I need you to come here and check my water and check my milk. Because I didn't want to have it, uh, that milk supply contaminate what goes to the public. I wanted to know where it was at. So they came out, did a test, and they said, uh, well, if this comes positive, you know that we're going to have to, you're going to have to start dumping your milk and we're gonna, you're going to lose your grade A permit. And I said, I understand, but I, I just need to know. Because I don't, I don't want to be held liable of something if, if this gets into the food supply. So they checked it and it was positive and we started dumping the milk. Uh, then I applied uh, for, for help with the uh, USDA and they had a program where they could help me pay for the dumping of the milk. We did that for two years and it's slowly coming out of the animals and it's slowly coming out of the milk. But one of the biggest problems I have is that it's in the animals. And so there's packing plants and beef operations that don't want this in their meat. And I even contacted the uh, people who buy dead animals and they didn't want them in their recipes either and they make dog food. So right now, my biggest issue is getting rid of the animals. I mean, I got 4,000 head here, over 1,000 head that have died from old age. I'm working with the USDA to come up with a plan to eradicate the animals. We've asked them multiple times. They have a program in place, but for some reason, they don't want to implement it. And um, we're struggling with them to figure out what we need to do with these animals. The local county guys and the city folks, they got their hands tied because Can Air Force Base is a very big, for our community, they're huge. You know, they bring a lot of uh, folks here, a lot of economic development. And I think the county and the city are worried that Can Air Force Base could leave if they put too much pressure on them. The county and the city supposedly say that the Air Force is not communicating with them because of the, of the, of the uh, lawsuit. They say that because I have a lawsuit with them that they can't talk to us. But it'd be nice if the Air Force and the DOD would actually say, okay, let's just sit down. Let's mitigate this problem. Let's fix this problem. What can we do? They, they know they're guilty. So what can we do to fix it? How can the cities help? How can the county help? How can we work together to get this problem resolved? Because kicking this problem down the road is just going to make the, the PFAS go farther down the road and pollute more water. They don't want to be at fault, but they are at fault. There's nowhere else in this area that PFAS could have gotten the ground. I have some of the best water in the ground here. I have one of the main water channels that are coming through here, and this is an excellent farm. But now they ruined it. Nobody wants to live in a community that has polluted water. There's other farms down the plume. There's other big businesses. One of the largest cheese plants in the United States is down the plume. You got the community's water supply down the plume. You got another community, Portalis's water supply down the plume. I mean, it just doesn't end, but we need to stop it here before it gets there so people are not affected. Hopefully, we'll be able to meet with them and have a resolution on what we're gonna do because this is ridiculous 
and and I but I really feel like the Air Force and the DOD has been pushing back on this whole situation because they don't want to be at fault. We don't know what it's going to cause. You know, you work hard, you 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 try to eat good, and then you you after you you find out that you've been drinking this water for 10, 15 years. I mean, really? I mean, that was devastating to know that, to find out that out. And your kids grew up on that water. It's just been hard on me and my wife and watching what we've done all these years and uh, what we've worked for. You know, because a farmer, normally, this is our 401k. So you work hard and you expect a return on your investment. And when, when your investment becomes worth zero, it affects you. And I don't want other people to have the same problem. And I'd be willing to sit down with uh, the Air Force and DOD and, and the community and work together. I mean, if I have to uh, give up some of my land to do this, I'll do that. But the way it's going now, it's just we're, n we're not making no progress. It's got to come from Washington, D.C. This has got to be fixed from there to here. And so um, I believe and I pray that that uh, they will finally see what they have caused here and, and, and take, take responsibility. Take responsibility. That's all I'm asking. You need to clean this. You need to take care of this problem. You ruined this land. Now this land needs to be yours. I just want to start over. You know, uh, I've got five grandchildren. I love them dearly. You know, not saying anything bad about bad about my kids. I love my kids, but I love my grandbabies, and I, and I just want to. Uh, I was hoping to to pass this on to my family for the next couple generations, but that's not going to be possible no more. So I want to start new, start fresh, and uh, and move on, and just get it behind us. The new boss is the same as the old boss for Albuquerque Police. Mayor Tim Keller named Harold Medina as his pick to lead the department. Mr. Medina is a longtime APD police, police person, of course, and has been interim chief since Mike Geyer's acrimonious departure last fall. Now, alongside Mr. Medina, though, is Sylvester Stanley. He's also a longtime law, local law enforcement veteran, and he'll be taking the post of superintendent of police reform. Now, that job includes running the department's academy and internal affairs, as well as handling compliance with the settlement agreement with the department, reached with the Department of Justice for unconstitutional policing, as you recall. Now, Serge, what do you make of this approach? It certainly wasn't what the mayor said he was looking to do, but here we are. What's your sense of it? Uh, you know, I'm of multiple different minds here. I applaud the sort of the idea of trying to be innovative, take a new approach, say, look, we're going to bifurcate this job and and say we're going to focus on, you know, have someone whose whole job is to focus on reform and the consent decree and all that and and important aspects of it while someone else can focus on, you know, the more of the actual policing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you said, the new chief is the same as the old chief. This this doesn't really seem to me to represent a real clean break if that's what we're going for. Um, you know, innovation combined with stodgy traditionalism and uh, predictability of saying, Yep, this is, you know, we had a nationwide search and it turns out we ended up with the person who was right. already sitting here. And, you know, nothing against uh, Chief Medina, but it doesn't seem to represent a real, you know, effort to to do the things that, that we were told was gonna, were going to happen. And again, I'm optimistic uh, at this innovative approach. I do have some concerns, you know, about having, are there two bosses? Are there two, you know, if someone doesn't uh -huh. like one thing, do you That's go right. to the other person? Right? Let, let me you know, let me spin um, those that. Those things don't always work out. You know, Serge, it's an excellent point you're starting to make. There, let me spin it to the lieutenant governor. I mean, lieutenant governor. Interestingly, what Serge is talking about is you're literally setting up a good cop, bad cop scenario inside the department just by doing it this way. Is there potential trouble down the road with this setup? You know, I'm, I'm a, I share the optimism for this division of labor as long as it's very clear mm -hmm. who's responsible for what. And I think that's really the important part uh, for, for both the department and the mayor. There's so many inherent systemic problems. Um, and 
both in the department and also in the drugs and gangs violence that's occurring in Albuquerque. And having someone laser focused on the crime part, I think is really, really important to the city of Albuquerque. And having someone who can deal with the Department of Justice and internal affairs and separate that out a little bit. I think it's, a, as, as Serge said, an innovative approach combined with some tradition. Let me, let me ask you this, Lieutenant Governor, it's great on paper. But, you know, cultures being what they are, at some point, someone's going to have to walk down the hall to Mr. Medina's office and say, you know what, we need to talk here because we really have a problem with your use of force from, you know, X situation last month. Then it gets tricky. I mean, who actually is in charge at that point? Right. And I think that's what the division of labor and the division of who has authority and responsibility for what. Mm -hmm. And then that has to be communicated to the rank and file. Right. And um, and they have to comply with it. And I know it's going to be difficult, but the other way has not worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it, we're not making enough progress within the department. So I I do think that um, that trying this innovation is is a positive step for the city. Mm -hmm. Daniel, I'm interested in your thoughts on that as well. I mean, it, it, as long as the issues are clearly defined, who does what, where, who has authority to do, you know, can this work? Is this the better way to go? Well, I, I think it can work. I think based on what you guys said, it's not going to work, right? You got one guy fighting crime and one guy running internal affairs. That ain't going to work. It's just not going to work. Um, so, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> you know, there's going to have to be clear divisions. I, I don't think you can send somebody out to fight crime and tell them they're not responsible for the academy and internal affairs and answering for what happens. We're going to put that in someone else's lap who's not out on the streets doing what needs to be done every day. So, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you said who does, who's ultimately responsible? The mayor. The mayor's responsible. Wow. I mean, that's the way it works. The mayor can have 25 assistants running the police department. At the end of the day, he's the one that's going to have to answer for the outcome of it. I'm not saying it's not going to work. It might work just fine. Mm -hmm. I, I would tell you. I would that tell is you what you said, Dan. <laughs> At the I'm beginning, not, you said it wasn't going to work. <laughs> no, I didn't say it was going to work. I said it's going to be a tough situation when you got someone doing this and someone doing that. What I will tell you is I think this whole idea that we have to go out of state to hire people all the time is not necessarily a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, if you've got this, the problems that uh, we've had for obviously multiple mayors, it's, I mean, you can't say it's a Republican or Democrat problem, the APD Fair problem. Point. That Fair point. Now, you know, to say, and we've gone out bunches of times to hire someone you know the first thing to do if you're going to if you're going to clean your house is you got to have someone that knows your house and so i think there's a good step in the right direction hiring folks locally than it is to bring people in from out of town and say hey we're going to give them a year and a half to figure each other out um you know i i'm optimistic we got no choice i mean when you're on your back everything's up from here um so mm -hmm. you know i'm some change has got to be better for Albuquerque. I'm just glad I live in Rio Rancho. We don't have these problems with crime. And, you know, apparently coming across the river to see a football game is only a further distance for criminals to come across the river and wreak havoc. So, you know, we're happy in Rio Rancho. Let me, Serge, let me ask you this. I okay, just wanted to say please. something about the line of authority. And those two people, the two superintendent and the chief, they have to know that they can talk to the mayor. Mm -hmm. Not anybody, not below the mayor. There's nobody intercepting and translating. They have to have a direct line to the mayor. But is that not the CAO? I mean, that's how the ladder works. I mean, that's who they're going to report to. It's not the mayor. But I think, as Dan said, it's the mayor's responsibility. We had this problem with RJ, remember, when RJ brought Darren White in to be the head of, you know, all of the fire department, police mm -hmm. department, and he was equal with the CAO and then you had the chiefs and I mean, it just became a, who could run to the mayor to get a decision first. Yeah. So you right. It's going to have to be a clear delineation. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, I don't think that'll ever be made public, but you'll know who has, who's wearing, you know, who, who's in charge based on what's happening. Right. If, if you start seeing serious reform, then, you know, the superintendent's making decisions. Let me, let me, I got to get something in Dan, uh, just a, sorry to cut you off. Just got about a minute here for, um, Serge, let's not forget, Mr. Medina was involved in at least two high-profile shootings, guys, including the death of Kenneth Ellis III in 2010. No irony here, that was one of the shootings that got the DOJ here in the first place. <laughs> and now the man is our chief of police. It, you know, 
things happen. Surge, is, is there something here that says, well, is, is our chief fully able to be outside of all this and see this clearly enough, considering his background in some of these things? Yeah, I mean, I do have some concerns about, you know, the, the baggage that, that comes along with with this and the shootings that he was involved in, or you know, where he was the the ranking officer on the scene, and and his involvement in all the things that we're saying, you know, we're going to put that behind us. It does seem like it's it's a real challenge to turn that corner when mm-hmm. we have the same person, literally the same person, you know, sitting in the chief's uh, office. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it seems you know. like we've got ACLU and a bunch of folks who are willing to give it a go. It may not be their first choice to do it this way, but they're willing to give it a go. We're up against the clock, guys. Have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for your thoughts this week. I'll be back in a moment with a few last words. The very first segment of coverage on coronavirus was early March last year, when my colleague Matt Grubb sat down with an official from New Mexico's Department of Health to get some clarity on all this. It's hard to imagine it, but there were no confirmed cases in the state at that time. And the message from Santa Fe was, quote, this is no time to panic. Well, we sort of did panic if toilet paper and hand sanitizer was the metric. At that point, the main goal was surfaces and washing hands, as you recall. The mask ask was many weeks down the road from that interview, as was the near full lockdown, including, of course, schools. Now, for most of us, I don't think any of that was even imaginable last March, but it did happen. But right now, I am grateful we are here in this place with vaccines getting into arms, schools about to open, and life somewhat operating again. A lot can happen in a year. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and the Dnieper Natural History Programming Fund for KNME-TV and viewers like you.